my name is Phil. This is a, you can see the picture of me pretend to be a geologist. Yeah, that's what you can see. Um, with the titles Supercontinents, Subduction, Superplumes and Sutures, a difficult breakup. There's a lot going on there in that title, but I'm going to break it down. For me, it's Monday morning. For you guys, it's, it might be kind of Monday afternoon. So um, so it's going to an easy start. Uh, there's a lot of co-authors on here. Uh, one of them including uh, is Kim, who's on, who's on the call. Uh, on, on various different projects we've been working on over the, over the past few years. Okay, so what I'm going to do actually is I, I think a lot of people in this on this talk hasn't haven't actually met me in person before, so I want to kind of give a little bit of an introduction to myself first uh, because that kind of makes it easier to to kind of to kind of talk about things. Um, I do a lot of numerical modeling of Rifton uh, using codes like Aspect. I've done it for a lot of years. Uh, I do. Uh, Mantle dynamics, kind of looking at the processes in the deep interior, as well as kind of looking at these shallow processes. Um, I'm big on science communication, which has put a lot of pressure on me, actually giving a pretty good talk, which I'm hoping to try and do today. Uh, I do uh, this the image here is from a paper uh, by Fabio Cremieri, Grace, and myself on, on kind of the misuse of color in, uh, in science communication. So I do a lot of work on that. And then I try and focus on uh, how to communicate best with people and I focus that on prison education using STEM as a kind of, of a way of rehabilitation in a think like a scientist project. This image here is of me pretending to be a geologist, but most of the time it's this, sat behind the computer doing numerical modeling. Um, and as a result, uh, I don't get out much is why I've kind of got this beard and looking a bit kind of frightening today. Um, but I will be at um, C e EGU and, and CGU this year. So if you see me, come and say hello, because um, and now system professor at the University of Toronto, always looking for graduate students, always looking for projects. And uh, I've got a wide range of interests and there's a lot of people here that are quite interesting to talk to. So that's an introduction to me. Um, this talk comes with a huge warning and the huge warning is that I am not very good at drawing, but everything to do with this is, I've drawn quite a lot of it. So I want collaborators who can draw um, to help in my artistic endeavors of talking about the supercontinent cycle and the processes. Also, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to answer too many questions on supercontinent breakup. I'm kind of going to pose the question, going to pose the questions rather than answer them. Uh, just to kind of give us an easy, easy, to, easy start to this session. Uh, so I might as well talk about what the supercontinent cycle is as they kind of get to get us started. This is one of the terrible drawings. I can only apologize. They do get better as the talk goes on though. Super a continent forms together through generally the closure uh, through subduction zones, bringing two continents together here. These are these are the greens, and this is the mantle. This is the core. Uh, once a continent supercontinent is formed, you have a kind of cessation of this interior supercontinent. This interior subduction, sorry, and a more focusing of subduction on its margins. There's subduction on the margins of the supercontinent throughout, but in this case, it's more focused. There's no interior subduction. And then you have a kind of lots of thermal activity, potentially uh, plumes, continental insulation, all this uh, activity forming, which could lead to the breakup of the continent shown here by the green uh, moving away. And then as they move away, it restarts again, and we all get back on on the on the air, on the on the cycle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just kind of talking briefly by a couple of minutes on on actually what supercontinent is. And the question that I like to talk about is uh, what makes a supercontinent super? Seems a really, really obvious question, uh, but it actually comes with a couple of, couple of big caveats. This is Pangaea here at 320 million years. You've got Laurentia, Bolica, Siberia, Amazonia, Gondwanda, all interconnected. Um, for a talk I did uh, a couple of years ago at the Canadian Geophysical Union, I went on Twitter and I asked the question, um, I thought it'd be fun. That's the type of fun I have. What makes a supercontinent super? Add your comments uh, in the in the Slido poll below. And I give four options, uh, whether it's size makes it super, it's impact, both or other. You are more than welcome to put in your com in the in the comments here uh, uh, what you think uh, makes a supercontinent super. For instance, what makes it a continent makes it into a supercontinent. So what's the difference between Africa compared to Pangaea, what, what is what the definition? Um, if you're watching on YouTube in the future, hit that like and subscribe button and put it in the comments. Uh, what the answer to this poll was, 
for the 56 people who gave gave the poll a couple of years ago, overwhelmingly it was uh, its size. That's what defines a supercontinent. How there's a few problems with that. What what size? Um, the you know Virginia is actually quite small. Pangaea isn't all of the continents together. So how can you define that? How can you define what the size is? Is it 100% in which none of these two, 100% of the continental material in which none of these two fall in that category? Is it 10%, 20%? Who knows? Fun fact, we don't have a definition, formal definition of a supercontinent. I think that's really interesting. Uh, it always blows my mind. We have definitions for everything, but not a supercontinent. One definition I like is by a uh, uh, friend, Daniel Pastor Galan, is that they suggest a supercontinent should be defined as a single continental plate with a size capable of modifying or controlling mantle dynamics and core mantle boundary processes, altering convection cells and enhancing thermal activity. I really like that because it it kind of gives us something to work with. Okay, what happens to to something once once a supercontinent form? Is that different to say Af underneath Africa today? Um, I like that so much that, you know, it should be one of them inspirational quote pictures that you have. Um, so I've made one. We can print this off. We can put it in your offices. That I think this is really, really, really nice. It's a really nice definition, something that I will, should take forward in my, in my work. So what does that mean? Well, actually, we've got a number of, number of uh, papers on this uh, over, the, over the past kind of 10, 12 years, that once you have a certain size of continent, you can thermal activity, mantle dynamics can, can, can start to occur and kind of focus on here. One of them things is continental insulation. This is another terrible drawing. Uh, let's just say you have a supercontinent over oceans and the mantle. Uh, oceans, you're going to get heat passing through the, the, the oceanic plate. Supercontinents or a continent material is reduced heat flux. It's big enough. If it's large enough, it's stationary enough. You could get a, a buildup of heat underneath your continent insulation, which could warm the mantle, which could end up ultimately leading to breakup. That is one process by which the supercontinent could potentially generate breakup. We've looked at this, and we have kind of some opinions on it, but it is one viable option. I prefer to look a bit deeper um, into how kind of rather l less shallow processes see how the how the deeper mantle kind of can can modify or control the, this mantle dynamics. And that kind of takes us on to the, the second part of the, um, of the talk. Uh, sorry, just checking your question there, Derek. Yeah, any, any questions, welcome. The subductions and superflumes, that kind of takes us on to this next part. So I'm gonna kind of reiterate this kind of supercontinent cycle because that's kind of the focus of, of the talk here. Pangaea formation, you have this interior subduction Kind of shown here to bring in bringing the, the continents together that's shown by this this diagram as i mentioned before this is actually a slightly better diagram uh, this was drawn by uh Kangoon, who's my uh, postdoc here at the university of toronto another excellent geodynamicist and a better artist than me um by 300 million years i have again this cessation of the initial subduction and you've got this focus of subduction in the cessation of the initial subduction, you've got this focus and other subduction around the outside. And what that can do is, let's just say you have this as the surface and this is the bottom of the mantle, you could have kind of focusing of uh, mantle flow beneath the supercontinent, which could in turn generate mantle dynamics that can trigger upwellings in the form of plumes, which could manifest itself as large igneous provinces at the surface. Just kind of simple mantle scooping up thermal instabilities uh, due to subduction oceans kind of converging on uh, on the mantle dynamics below. Could be some interaction with piles at the bottom of the core mantle boundary. These are seismic images of the large low shear velocity provinces. We've done a fair amount of work on that, how uh, how how these can these can potentially move in shape or be stationary over time. But there's an impact of subduction there that's actually could be quite important. And these plumes could also end up being large igneous provinces which could generate potential breakup. Loads of people have done lots of work on this. Uh, this is an image by Luca, um, much better artist than me as well. R wonderful kind of drawn again, showing the, this potential process. Lots and lots of different uh, papers have looked at kind of subduction driven plumes that potentially could lead to mantle, mantle breakup. I think that's about the 10 minute mark there, isn't it, Derek? Yep, that's 10 minutes. Perfect. Thanks. So what we've done in this process of, of kind of look at this deep mantle dynamics is um, we've looked at numerical modeling. 
uh, and to try and understand where do these plumes form in 2D and 3D models, in particular in CAR-Ts and, and spherical shell. So kind of to, to go over this point again, so this is the cycle and this is how we kind of model it. Let's just take a 2D slice, a 2D, um, a 2D kind of spherical, spherical model here. So this, this is the thermal field. It's cold material at the bottom, hot material. <laughs> cold material at the top, hot material at the bottom. We've kind of got a dense pile in here as well, kind of shown uh, our model, large, large, low shear, large, low shear velocity provinces. And uh, we kind of try to model each step of this supercontinent cycle. So here we've got um, the interior subduction section showing uh, a subduction being formed, and this is kind of modeling that as two continents kind of come together potentially. It's just the surface surface velocity kind of force and subduction here. And after a certain amount of time, once the mantle's kind of started to stir, we then decide to place a supercontinent on top, which limits the um, subduction, which well stops this interior subduction, starts subduction forming on its margins, and you have kind of that one hemisphere is just a supercontinent. And from there, we can start to understand, okay, well, once we've got this, where do we generate plumes from and whether are they forming at certain distances in certain areas and could this lead to breakup one of the papers we did a fair few years ago now is looking at this generation of plumes and is there a kind of a subduction plume distance that we can start to look at so we tested lots and lots of different mantle parameters which you can do with numerical modeling threw lots of stuff at it in lots of 2D simulations to kind of get a big bulk of information behind us. And we tried to analyze the distance from subduction to plume under a supercontinent and found that uh, this, this kind of area here, we found that there's a kind of a critical width through testing lots of different mantle parameters of about 1400 to 4,600 kilometers potentially that could form a, a plume underneath this supercontinent. So not really close to a super, uh, subduction zone, but not mega far away is kind of a critical area. And again, lots of people have done kind of work on this and we've just kind of thrown our hat into the ring. But not a lot of people have worked on um, oceanic lodging as provinces, uh, which is kind of this process where you've got plumes potentially forming in the ocean side rather than underneath the supercontinent. So think of more Anton Java plateau rather than say, uh, in terms of lodging as provinces than Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So we've been recently running some large, new uh, 3D spherical numerical models to kind of look at this oceanic logic in this province issue, meta, where can plumes form in the same way to potentially generate oceanic logic in these provinces. And what we found in, in these models, if you just take kind of a slice, uh, you can actually generate uh, subduction driven uh, backflow almost to generate these oceanic logic in these provinces. This is kind of just a, a showing that on Tong Java plateau kind of can form in the same time and in the same place just due to the subduction of the end of a supercontinent. This work we'll be talking about in EGU. Again, I've just talked about it for about 45 seconds there, but we can talk about it more after. Um, so another take on point is can we predict plume positions through supercontinent subduction dynamics? Uh, that's another kind of question. And this is all kind of focused in here. And these plumes, continent insulation, can they lead to breakup, which is the kind of point of this session? Don't quite know yet. More work to be done. Last point, sutures. I was never going to talk about this, but I wanted to put it in to kind of increase the heart rate of the conveners, thinking that would run out of time. Uh, I've done a lot of work on sutures in the past. We can talk about that at a later date. Uh, to wrap up, questions that I asked myself. How do plumes influence breakup? Can we predict where plumes are expected to form? How much of a role does content insulation play in breakup? Uh, how much of a role does lodging in this problem? Uh, LSVPs play in mantle dynamics. How do we define a supercontinent? Lots of modeling questions and talks about sutures and scars. A couple of take home points from this talk as a summary um, introduction to myself. Hello. We don't have a formal definition of a supercontinent. Subduction can potentially control mantle flow and generate deep super plumes. Um, oceanic lodging provinces could form through circum supercontinent subduction backflow. But you will always remember, I think, from this talk, if nothing else, uh, my terrible drones, I think, um, which is this. I do love the supercontinent cycle. There's lots and lots going on here. There's breakup, there's continental collisions, there's sutures, there's subduction. I think there's a real lot we can do, and I'm happy to take any questions on it. Okay, thanks, Phil. So, are there any questions? There's a question in the chat here, actually. Brandon, you want to 
ask the question or I can read it out? Well, Phil, if you can read it and just, just yeah, answer. Yeah, I can read it, yeah. So uh, deep-seated mantle plumes are necessary consequence of supercontinent formation. Um, though it was debated, it seems that some lodging provinces have geochemical signatures shallow and melting. Yeah, exactly, such as, uh, yeah, so... Uh, it, though it's, it's debated, it seems that lot, some lodging in these provinces have geochemical signatures of shallow or melting and metasomalized enriched mantle, such as central and magmatic province. Yeah, great question. So these are kind of other things that are are related. So there's uh, there's a kind of a a link that there's potentially more lodging in these provinces after supercontinent formation. Um, but it's not necessary that every lodging in this province is related to. A deep mantle plume. This is kind of the 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 taking apart the, the the deep dynamics and the and the shallow dynamics part of it. It may be that some of these large, some of these especially oceanic lodging provinces may not be related to related to a mantle plume at all. However, what we're doing is trying to figure out whether it, you know what are the processes even uh, can a mantle plume even be uh, linked to it. Uh, can we run these numerical models to see? Do we get them in the right positions? Are they are they are they in the right timings? Can they even be linked? So to answer your question, they're not necessarily a consequence of supercontinent formation, but we do see more an increase in large ignorance provinces after supercontinent formation. And our numerical models um, can show you know potential increases in these in kind of plumes, which may or may not be linked to large ignorance provinces. Okay, thanks. I think there's a quick question from Kim. Hey, Phil. Uh, great talk. Hi, Kim. Uh, very Canadian of you to start your talk with an apology. So kudos. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting there. Uh, my question was just in terms of those oceanic lips, which seem super counterintuitive. What's the driving mechanism? Or can you give us like one teaser parameter as to what could drive that? Yeah, it's a, so... Uh, yeah, oh, there we go. So interestingly, so we, we were kind of looking at forming plumes underneath a uh, forming plumes underneath a, a supercontinent. We've looked at that a few times, and you just get subduction kind of pouring in, and then a plume forming out underneath the supercontinent. But actually, you know, this downwelling can actually form convection currents on either side. So, is there a, is there a difference between it forming underneath and forming either on other on on the other side? Like there's still there's still flow. Um, hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to be focused in one direction. Even the subduction polarity can generate kind of a convection cell either side. So um, we thought that was kind of an interesting idea. And there's there's links. Ontong Java has been linked to potential plume. It has been linked to not a, not a plume. We thought actually could we could we just have a look at that and see see could you do it? So we've run numerical three D numerical models where it's, the surface is just being pushed by subduction. So there's no other processes in to drive the mantle dynamics, and um, we can. You, you can generate a kind of plume at this in the, in, the, in a kind of that kind of location. So that's it's it's just kind of mantle flow basically. That's what we're kind of we're kind of looking at. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Phil. That was brilliant.